Mind Body Life show hosted by Frederick Entman on Global Voice Radio on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern. During his show, Mind Body Life founder and best-selling author Frederick Entman investigates the little-known insights and daily methods used to create explosive life transformations and transitions with those that have risen from struggle and ascended to greatness. Here is your Mind Body Life host, Frederick Entman. Welcome to the Mind Body Life show. I'm your host, Frederick Entman. I'm a former professional athlete, a best-selling author of Surviving Sports in the Game of Life, a coach, a consultant, and I help individuals from all walks of life, but most notably, I help professional athletes create lasting success and win the game of life. Welcome to episode 45. This is very special and very unique in the sense I'm actually going to talk about the lost art of being or thinking for yourself in America and then improving brain connectivity and function so that you can enhance your thinking functionality. And I'm first going to start with my perspective, which I can only describe as an awakening after living and studying abroad. Um, I worked on a PhD dissertation at the same school in Germany that uh, Friedrich Nietzsche went to and other very high uh, reveled uh, thinkers of the world. But then I returned to America and I watched and I've been observing through different lens over the past 15 years. Then at the very end, I'm going to go over ways to actually increase your brain connectivity and function. After all, uh, my brand is Mind, Body, Life. Trust me when I say I'm here to help. I care very deeply about um, my country, America. I am American. And um, I think that there's never been a, a time in this country's state of being that needed authentic leaders ever before. So that's why this particular episode is so important because I'm going to go over several, several things that um, I think are the uh, utmost important foreground uh, if we're to really come out of this ridiculousness that we've, we've dug ourselves into. Anyway, I really want to start by... I guess saying why the price of, and I'll say quote unquote safety in a quote unquote hostile world is conformity and inauthenticity. I've just had this talk with my my father who's a small business owner and we are fourth generation entrepreneurs in this country. Um, All very successful. It's something that even my father has, has noticed is there really the lack of moralistic um, and authenticity and integrity as, as a baseline has really gone to the wayside and everything's just become um, law advocate, big government. I mean, you might even find this particular episode unfair probably and baffling and infuriating too, since it's gonna reason psychologically, but especially in America now, we're taught only to ever think uh, economistically, like we're lab rats, not human beings. But still, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and I thought I'd share this with you. So first and foremost, I call it the look, and by now, So do my non-American friends. It's kind of dumbfounded expression, kind of an open mouth, slack jawed look somewhere between rage, denial, and contempt. Kind of a ploy at mindlessness that conceals a desperate effort not to have to do the hard work of thinking, feeling, and truly knowing oneself. The look, it goes like this. Hey, so awkward question. You guys know that putting little kids in a cage is wrong? 
and there's a glowering silence, right? I mean, you're putting little kids on trial and the look. Come on, you don't have a problem with that? And of course, I'm assuming the, re the, pro the reply is going to be snapped. Of course, I do have a problem with that, but it's not Nazi Germany. We'll fix it. I know we will, and they're doing it, not us. And the look after something so explosive of a response that, you know, I, I just kind of made up, by the way, that's everyone's in the world's face to this response. And you see, I bet you might even be doing the look. Like, what, what the heck? If you notice, there's a little reactivity. But should you be, or should you be telling everyone, no, holy hell, this dude is an insult to the world Philistine right now. And I'm not judging you, trust me. I'm just observing. And again, here's what I see. And also, the, you know, some of my friends that have lived worldwide as well, so they did, so do they lately. And quite frankly, um, that's not an American feature to actually step back and observe and uh, actually think critically. Something seems to have short circuited in the American mind. You know, it's like smoke is billowing out from it. You just can't discuss moral concerns with Americans in any reasonable way anymore. They don't listen. They pretend to, sure, but they're not hearing you at all. They, oh, it's like they play dumb, the look, until you shut up and go away or provoke them into lashing out. It's become a very volatile, very divided country. Um, so all in all, they've developed a kind of armor, like this defensive shield, a set of what which, which I'd call psychologically infantile mechanisms to ally what should be grave and maybe existentially threatening moral concerns as in, if I'm a part of a society that allows this to go on, then wow, I might be a bad person. Yes, you might be. Hooray. Exactly. My fully functioning adult friend, that is what a moral concern is. But Americans these days seem to have minds that work precisely the opposite way. The defenses rise suddenly so that exactly the inverse thought is produced. They're doing it, not me. Me? I'm a good person. It's understandable. We all want and need to believe that we are good people, after all. The infantile mind in us does anyways, above all. It will do almost anything to preserve that belief. Have you ever seen how abused kids will often become even more attached to their parents precisely because they are insecure, at least until they're numbed by trauma? That's the infantile mind at work. Pay attention. It is using what Winnicott, a great master of psychology, by the way, that unfortunately most Americans have never heard of, called the moral defense. The neglected child comes to believe that he is all bad and the parents are all good. He's a source of all the rage and fury. And in that way, he can attach himself to something pure and good. And at least in that way, Maintain the need for inner goodness indirectly, even if it vanishes the moment separation occurs, because he believes he's all bad and it's all his fault again. I've come to believe that something exactly like what Winnicott described is going in the American mind today. What else explains the look, the total numbed shutdown? Now, the plain dumb that happens whenever you ask an American, hey, listen, do you know how serious this is? My friends, even Kafka balked at putting kids on trial, okay? Even Kafka. If you know Franz Kafka, does anyone know who Franz Kafka is anymore? Yet a whole nation is in this deep and profound denial, not intellectually or cognitively. Defenses again, remember? 
but emotionally, morally, primally, deep down in the soul and the gut where the blood should run cold. And that's about the state it's in from what I see. And no, a march once a year does not cut it, folks. It is exactly a catharsis that allows denial to function on an everyday basis. We march, whoo, our work is done. Maybe we send an outraged tweet or two, and then it's back to life as usual. We send out some rant posts or, or uh, hey, this will awaken some people. But all, all they're doing is flipping through the, the hundreds of other crap on their social networks, just thumbing mindlessly. No one's taking any action. The only action people are taking is work, lunch, work, dinner, drink, sleep, repeat, recycle, normality these days, right? But nothing is actually normal around us, is it? So let's go back to the look. Hey, we'll fix it. It's not Nazi Germany. Uh, you see what happened there? That was two wrongs make a right, preceded by denial, preceded by command, and then in an, in an, in imperative. All these are the defenses of an infantile mind playing precisely Winnicott's game. As long as I'm attached to the mother object, which is pure and perfect, and so am I. I'm infallible. So there's no question of imperfection in the mother object allowed. That's precisely why infants employing Winnicott's, I'm only good as long as I'm attached to the mother object. Moral defense also come to be characterized then by what Balby famously called an insecure attachment style. A term we use today casually, but is anything except casual. Insecure really means that the infant is not learning to individuate. That's right. To see themselves as independent, to strike out on their own. And this is because they don't feel safe. Don't you see? Hey, I hope a light bulb just went off. They're trapped in a hostile world, one of neglect, one of cruelty, one of abandonment, maybe even annihilation. So they always must cling to mother, to safety, to protection. Uh, but isn't all that exactly what we see in Americans too? They live lives of profound insecurity, economic precarity, social atomization, cultural cruelty, and above all, the strange myth of individualistic self-reliance. All these things leave Americans just like Baldi's infant, trapped in a profoundly hostile, dangerous, and unsafe world. What are they to do? Well, what they do is attach themselves, just like insecure infants, to a primary source of security, to mother objects. You might observe that it's often a job a church, a city, or a hobby. Guys who take video games just a wee bit, way too seriously, but I think it cuts deeper than that. Americans are devoted to their tribes and their hierarchies above all. I'll say that again. Americans are devoted to their tribes and especially their hierarchies above all. They will only, from what I've noticed, and I mean only, Listen to people who are in the tribe and above them in that tribe's hierarchy. I'm saying in general, people, okay? I, don't, I know some independent thinkers. That's cool. I'm saying in general. There's a movement, all right? So what do I mean by tribes? Something like the intersection of race plus a little bit of social stratum, maybe. You know, you've got your, uh, these are just examples middle-class soccer moms, mostly white, but if you're black, okay, but you better not be a Drake fan. Best Buy dads, it's okay if you're brown, but you better be wearing the right kind of chinos. Urban hipsters will accept anyone, as long as they're bearded outlaw sheriffs, if they're men, and especially dainty and girly to the point of caricature, if they're women. Are you starting to see what I mean by tribe? Social organizations that aren't purely racially exclusive. Something more like clubs that you can join if you're the wrong race, but only if you fit the mold perfectly and never ever diverge. Tribes are America's mother objects, if you ask me. 
Why is it that America is so dominated by these tribes like no other nation? Really, go to Canada, go to Britain, go to Germany, go to France, go to Italy. You'll see people mostly being themselves. Sure, everyone wears a mask, but mostly people's masks are their own. People's masks are their own. From what I've seen outside of America. Americans wear masks. They all seem to buy at the same stores. Tribally approved ones. Masks. The true self and the false self. What is the insecure infant afraid of ever really being? Or showing? Or displaying? Or becoming? It's true self. It is true self. It learns that the true self is dangerous in this country. Maybe the true self cries too much. Maybe the parent is threatened by a uh, deviation from conformity. So the infant develops a shell, a mask of inauthenticity. It pours all its energies into that shell, into being, developing, sustaining, creating a false self. Mannerism, actions, communication. But now there's a very big problem. The false self denies the true self, and it's the true self who has all the needs. The American smile, the look. What's true about these things? The world knows it. Hell, American movies are famous because of it. What's true about them all is that they're fake. They're plastic, as false as Trump's hair. Americans are notorious for faking it, aren't they? Not just outwardly, but more deeply inwardly. Emissions and grins and careful politeness. And it masks the seething rage that an Italian might vent, gesturing skywards, or a desperate loneliness that a Frenchman might light up a cigarette and pout over. But the American smiles through it all. That same plastic smile, that rictus grin of the false self, the mother object, the hostile world, safety, protection, inauthenticity, conformity. So I begin by asking, why do Americans seem to shut down whenever genuine and grave moral concerns are even raised? Why the look? And my answer goes something like this. They live trapped in a hostile, unsafe, and deeply threatening world which constantly threatens to annihilate them, to wipe them out. And to a point, causes a a complete paranoia that keeps you in a state of fight or flight. Lives, in other words, of insecurity. Not just economic, but psychological too. This is, folks, you are living amongst psychological warfare. When you are in a state of fight or flight, you're going to make rash uh, decisions. That usually leads to overspending, if you haven't noticed. It'll usually lead to overeating, if you haven't noticed. You're going to fill that with a void, and at the end of the day, it's going to affect your life, usually your bank account, too. Like insecure children to parents, you know, they attach themselves desperately to the few sources of safety there are. Their tribes, which become their mother objects. The sources of safety, those tribes are seen as pure, perfect, inviolable. Because as long as the attachment is maintained, so too can one sense of goodness. You get it? But the price is a soul, is really... The price is a false self. That fake American Rick to smile, even though that self smiling is lonely, miserable, anguished, wracked with shame and guilt and fear, in very real and profound psychological pain, but at least I'm a good person. See me, see me smiling? I'm part of the tribe. I'm strong. I belong. Mommy will protect me. I exist as long as I can fake it. That's the price, but the cost, the moment you raise the question of a moral concern, you also ask, hey, are you really a good person? And bang, the defenses have to go up. Just as if you were attacked, if you have attacked an insecure child's once anchor in a hostile world, 
We're good people. Don't you dare attack the tribe because if the moral defense doesn't work, you see, then the anchor, the parent, the tribe can't provide any safety in such a hostile or cruel world after all. If the parent, the tribe isn't good, then who is? Maybe no one, maybe nothing. Maybe no one or nothing can be anymore. And if you're forced to think that too hard, too long, you'll go into kind of an in consolable grief and your mind will possibly shatter the answer if there can be said to be answers to these subtle and delicate issues of the mind is something like this to grow beyond the full self slowly and delicately with grace and beauty and care as much as one can without fully leaving the safety of the anchor or the tribe or the parent to say one day one way at a time hey maybe the wrong way we are doing this thinking about or going about this is wrong even if our source of safety says it's the right way that doesn't mean we're bad people but we could we could be if we do enough bad things that is a maturity i suppose not to relativize evil you know or evaporated away but to really grapple with it and know that people can indeed not just do evil but be evil too if that is they are incapable of thinking morally at all i don't think that's where americans are yet but i think it's where they're going if they're not careful um i'm going to now go while i guess i can transition into more thinking Having been a literature teacher and having uh, worked on a, a liter, literature dissertation, I really have done a ton of research in my days. And actually, it's one of my strengths that I love to research. Um, and I was actually just talking to my, my very own children about how important reading is. They always want to know why I have so many books. Uh, I grew up with books. My mother was a librarian. Thank goodness, because reading fiction has, is proven scientifically through the top neurosurgeons. Uh, you know, reading fiction improves brain connectivity and function. People don't read anymore. They're, you're always scanning their phones aimlessly, which is proven to shrink your brain, actually. Reading a novel has the power to reshape your brain and improve theory of mind pay attention theory of mind also known as tom theory of mind yes very important if we know this why is the rise of tv and screen time higher than ever that's what i want to know neuroscientists have actually discovered that reading a novel can improve brain function on a variety of levels okay and the re there's a recent study on the brain benefits of, of reading fiction that was conducted at emory university in atlanta georgia in the study titled Short and Long-Term Effects of a Novel on Connectivity in the Brain. It was recently published in the journal Brain Connectivity. And the researchers found that becoming engrossed in a novel enhances connectivity in the brain and improves brain function. Interestingly, reading fiction was found to improve the reader's ability to put themselves in another person's shoes and flex the imagination in a way that's similar to the visualization of a muscle memory in sports. See how I'm weaving all this together? Kind of clever, huh, folks? Pay attention. Modern day reading habits continue to evolve in a digital age, actually. And statistics vary on exactly how many people are reading novels this decade compared to decades past. There is a definite trend for general readers to buy more fiction than nonfiction books and to get facts, news, and crystallized knowledge from the internet. And in fact, in uh, 2015, only four of the top 20 books were nonfiction titles. And according to Carol Fitzgerald of the Book Report Network, people are interested in escape. In a number of pages, the story will open, evolve, and close, and, and a lot of what's going on in the world today is not like that. You've got this encapsulated escape that you can enjoy. 
Again, that's Carol Fitzgerald of the Book Report Network. When was the last time you took time to actually read a good novel? I read some Hemingway over the weekend. Um, my background is having been a professional athlete, um, I was always an avid reader, but after my career was over, I really upped that uh, and replaced all the time I used to spend with, on, with a basketball with my mind. And I would read three novels a week. And I've been doing that over the past 20 years. I uh, highly recommend it. If, if you claim to not have the time to read a novel a week, I'm sorry, but you are lying to yourself. Are you someone who even likes to read novels? And surprisingly, you know, 42% of college graduates will never read a book again after graduating college. And the 2012 uh, Internet and American Life Project survey found that people who like to read fiction are driven by personal enrichment and described what they like about reading, saying things like, I love being exposed to ideas and being able to experience so many times, places, and events. Quote. Another person was quoted as saying, I look at it as a mind stimulant and it's relaxing. Quote. Others express the pleasure of living vicariously through a character and having another life of the mind, so to say. Also, according to this study, reading is a lifestyle choice that's also driven by desire to unplug from a constant stream of visual information. I think that's what I like about it most is my, my feeds my imagination and I can just create. I love it. Readers also have said things like, it's better for me to imagine things in my head than watch them on TV. It's an alternate uh, to TV that beats TV every time. Reading is better than anything electronic. Quote, I couldn't agree more. And one respondent captured the general sentiment of avid fiction readers by saying, I love being able to get outside myself. One of, one of the benefits of getting outside yourself by putting yourself in someone else's shoes through a novel is that it improves, again, theory of mind, Tom. And as the father of um, adolescent kids, you know, I realized the imaginative and cognitive benefits of children losing themselves in a good story and learning to then empathize with a fictional character. I, I brought my kids up with reading. Um, wasn't forced on them, but I, I let them see the benefits at a very early age. Um, Although lots of people are still reading fiction, you know, this new study, it really confirms that people of all ages should be encouraged to increase reading time while striving to reduce TV time. The average American home has almost three TV sets. It's actually 2.86, which is roughly 18% higher than in the year 2000, which had 2.43 sets per home and 43% higher than in 1990, which had a rate of two sets. In America, there's currently more televisions per home than human beings. And on average, children under the age of eight spend over 90 minutes a day watching television or DVDs. The stats are staggering and really disruptive. I mean, nearly 33% of American children live in a household where the television is on all or most of the time. Children between the ages of 8 and 18 years old watch an average of three hours of television a day. A day. On average, 61% of children under two use some type of screen technology and 43% watch television every day. This is ridiculously disturbing to me folks i don't know about you but this is not normal one of the problems of watching television is it reduces theory of mind tom it's this theory of mind is so important because it's really the ability to attribute mental states so beliefs intense desires pretending knowledge and etc to oneself 
and others, and then to understand that others have beliefs, desires, and intentions that are different from one's own. See what's happening here, people. As if, if you can't blindly see the correlations between the increase of television watching and how divided this society is, uh, it doesn't take a dummy to figure out that um, this country is being systematically programmed and dumbed down. You know, unfortunately, television is the least interactive in any new media and is the one likely to reduce theory of mind. Very dangerous. And I read a paper titled, The Relation Between Television Exposure and the Theory of Mind Amongst Preschoolers. It was published in November 2013 in the Journal of Communication. A brilliant, brilliant piece of work. The researchers found that preschoolers who have a TV in their bedroom and are exposed to more background TV have a weaker understanding of other people's beliefs and desires and reduced cognitive development. That's right. You watch television, your brain shrinks. The changes caused by reading a novel, on the other hand, were registered in the left temporal cortex, and this is an area of the brain associated with receptivity for language, as well as the primary sensory motor region of the brain. So neurons of this region have been associated with tricking the mind into thinking it's doing something it is not. A it's really a phenomenon known as grounded or embodied cognition. And an example of embodied cognition is similar to visualization in sports. Just thinking about playing basketball, for example, can activate neurons associated with the physical act of playing basketball. And actually in high school, I remember I was out, I think with an ankle injury, you know, very minor, maybe three four days and I came back like I didn't miss any days and the coach even said wow it's like you haven't skipped a beat well that's because I mentally would still practice now stories shape our lives and in some cases help define a person and that is from Dr. Burns who's director of Emory's University Center of Neuro Policy in Atlanta. And he added, we want to understand how stories get in your brain and what they do to it. The storytelling aspect of a novel is really a multifaceted form of communication that engages a broad range of brain regions, according to this article. And although several linguistic and literary theories describe what constitutes a story, Neurobiological research has just begun to identify the brain networks that are active when processing stories, okay? So to determine a time frame of which connectivity in the brain lasted the longest, the researchers measured changes in resting state connectivity before and after reading a novel. And the researchers chose a novel over a short story because the length and depth of the novel would allow them to set a repeated, um, these repeated engagements with associated unique stimuli. So those are simply sections of a novel set in a broader controlled stimulus context that can be consumed between several periods in a brain scan. Now what that means is that the researchers took MRI scans the brains of 21 undergraduate students while they rested. Then the students were asked to read sections of the 2003 thriller novel Pompeii by Robert Harris over nine nights. And then the students' brains were scanned each morning following the nightly reading assignment and then again daily for five days after they had finished the book. The scans revealed heightened connectivity within the students' brains on the mornings following the reading assignments. And the areas with enhanced connectivity included the students' left temporal cortex, an area of the brain associated with language comprehension, as well as the brain's central um, sulcus is what it's called, which is associated with sensations and movement. 
Dr. Burns notes again, the anterior front bank of the sulcus contains neurons that control movements of parts of the body. And he added, the posterior rear bank contains neurons that receive sensory input from the parts of the body. Enhanced connectivity here is a surprise finding, but it implies that perhaps the act of reading puts the reader in the body of the protagonist, quote. Wow, so the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes through embodied cognition is key, okay? It's actually absolutely key to improving theory of mind and also the ability to be compassionate. Interesting, huh? Although this study does not directly draw these conclusions, it seems like common sense that if we encourage our children to read, as opposed to turning out through television and screen time, theory of mind, Tom, and the ability to be compassionate to another person's suffering will improve. Again, it's just it's a correlation. So reading a good novel allows your imagination to take flight, folks. Novels allow you to forget about your day-to-day -day troubles and to transport yourself to a fantasy world that becomes a reality in your mind's eye. Rarely is the movie adaptation of a book ever quite as good as the original novel, right? Even the most advanced special effects will always fall short of the visual power of your very own imagination. And when you're not, a, I think people don't read anymore is because it seems like work. Well, what doesn't add first? You have to flex your muscles and train your muscles first to get the most out of them, right? The same way. You know, at a minimum, we can say that reading stories, especially those with strong narrative arcs, it reconfigures your brain networks for at least a few days from this, at least the study has proven that. It shows how then the stories can stay with us. And, it, and this might have a profound implication for children and then the role of reading and shaping their brains. Who actually... <laughs> It just blows my mind, this, what this world we're living in. Who would have thought it would become common day to see six-year-olds glued to watching DVDs wherever they are? In the, I see them everywhere, in the car, at the grocery store, even out for dinner. And like most parents, I do, to a point, struggle to limit my kids' screen time. But it, it seems to kind of be a constant battle. And I, I also have to say my kids are fantastic students. They do their homework first. They are very committed at, to their athletics as well. So I kind of allow a small little downtime. We might get one hour a day, okay, but they've earned it. And that's just from, from my point of view, for what I allow. Um, but I do struggle with it. Um, it just, you know, my daughter, my very own daughter is not alone in this TV addiction. She loves her shows. But yes, I think all in all, most kids seem to crave television. It's a problem. I remember back even uh, when I was a kid, I craved those Saturday cartoons. And I can't tell you the, why I was pulled into that television, but I was. And it was a problem for my mom. She'd catch me constantly turn on the TV and it'd be a constant struggle. The statistics on daily child and screen time and the negative impact that television has on cognitive development is alarming. It's absolutely alarming. And despite these new technologies like iPads and video games, television continues to dominate children's screen time. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, I also read of uh, the, you know, the relation between television exposure and the theory of mind amongst preschoolers. This was published on November 19th, 2013 in the Journal of Communication. And the researchers found that, again, preschoolers who have a TV in their bedroom and are exposed to more background TV of a weaker understanding of others beliefs and desires and reduced cognitive development. So I, I'm going back to that paper because 
For this new study, researchers at The Ohio State University, just down the road from me, interviewed and tested 107 children and their parents to determine the relationship between preschoolers' television exposure and their understanding of mental states, such as beliefs, intentions, and feelings, and known um, the theory of mind, or Tom, right? So parents of children in the study were asked to report how many hours of TV their children were exposed to, including background TV. This is, this is really interesting. Then the children were given tasks based on theory of mind. These tasks assessed whether the children could acknowledge that others can have different beliefs and desires, that beliefs can be wrong, and that behaviors stem from beliefs. The researchers also found that having a bedroom TV and being exposed to more background TV was in fact related to a weaker understanding of mental states. Even after counting for different in performance based on age and socioeconomic status of a parent. And this study is really unique in that it shows that TV exposure may impair children's theory of mind development. And this, this impairment may be partly responsible for disruptive social behaviors. Interestingly enough, preschoolers whose parents talked with them about the potential drawbacks of watching too much TV actually performed better on theory of mind assessments. This is so, this is so key, folks, because I'm, I'm now going to go into something even more disturbing. You know, when when children achieve a theory of mind, they have reached a very important milestone in their social and cognitive development. And children with more development, these more developed theories of mind are better able to participate in social relationships. This is proven. These children can engage in more sensitive, cooperative interactions with other children and are less likely to resort to aggression as a means of achieving goals. So now that made me think of, okay, could the dramatic rise of so-called ADHD and all these other learning disabilities be linked to screen time? And actually, there's a different study um, that found nearly half of the U.S. children diagnosed with ADHD received that diagnosis by age six. And over 3.5 million children in the U.S., that's 6% of four to 17 year olds, okay, were reported by their parents to be taking hardcore big pharma medication for ADHD, which is actually almost a 30% increase from 2007 to 2012. 6.4 million children in the US, 11% of four to 17 year olds were reported by their parents to have received an ADHD diagnosis from the healthcare provider a 42% increase from 2003 to 2012. What do you think? What do you think about that? There's a new study published in the Journal of American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and it reported that an estimated 2 million more children in the United States have been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder between 2003 and 2012. One million more U.S. children were taking medication for ADHD between 2003 to 2012. I want to know what's causing the dramatic increase in ADHD diagnosis. I mean, is ADHD really on the rise as much as the statistics suggest? My gut tells me no. I know it might be dangerous to say that, but my intuition says, nah, BS. I mean, what are the long-term impacts of pumping these young American children full of pharmaceuticals that are very, very powerful? 
You know, children's bodies and minds have evolved for millennia without these costly drugs, without these harmful drugs. You know, they do have side effects. It seems that taking these medications would be a shock to the delicate balance of the developing body and the minds of our children. Talking about stimulants like, like Ritalin, uh, Concerta, amphetamines like Dexedrine or Adderall, and antidepressants like Wellbutrin. They're all commonly prescribed to treat ADHD. I hope I'm not the only one that sees this as problematic. And then undoubtedly, taking these drugs will have a dramatic impact on the long-term neurobiology of anyone who starts taking them at a young age. I don't care how doctor white coat you think you are. It's insanity. I, I believe that physical activity is a potential antidote for ADHD. Not potential, but I know it is. Pharmaceuticals are not the answer. Big pharma is not the answer. Wouldn't allowing kids to run outside and get fresh air and naturally stimulate their, their norepinephrine and, and dopamine and serotonin and play more every day to help relieve some of their pinup energy, make them less prone to their hyperactivity and make it easier to sit still and focus. I mean, it just seems so common sense. And then not to mention in, in addition to the obesity epidemic, which threatens the physical health of American children, sitting in front of a TV screen and being sedentary weakens the child's ability to focus, have fear of mind and impairs cognitive development you know it's as i was researching and studying to prepare myself for this podcast uh, which i know i'm throwing a lot out there but it's all intertwined it's um young hollywood stars of the mgm era used to be actually given uppers much like adderall and dexedrine which are now commonly prescribed for ADHD, again, Judy Garland, one of the most famous young stars of all time. And many other young performers, by the way, were constantly given amphetamines to keep up with the hectic pace of filmmaking, to not gain weight, and then given barbiturates to help them fall asleep. And for Judy Garland, let's not forget that it was this regular dose of uppers and downers that led to addiction and a life long struggle with drugs, which led to her early death at the age of just 47 years old. And Garland always blamed Jim for robbing her of her youth. And on the flip side, Little Women author Louisa May Alcott often described the passion for physical activity she had as a child. And Alcott had an ecstatic connection to running that seemed deeply embedded in her cells. She loved to run through the woods as a child, and Louisa May Alcott, again, the author of Little Women, said, Active exercise was my delight from the time when a child of six, I drove my hoop around the common without stopping to the days when I did my 20 miles in five hours and went to a party in the evening. I always thought I must have a deer or a horse. <laughs> I always thought I must have been a deer or a horse in some former state because it was such a joy to run. No boy could be my friend until I'd beaten him in a race. No girl, if she refused to climb trees, leap fences, and be a tomboy. My wise mother, anxious to give me a strong body to support a lively brain, turned me loose in the country and let me run wild. Quote, I know the times have changed, but Louisa May Alcott's mom was wise to understand the importance of physical activity on a child's developing brain. Parents of today could benefit by adhering to her wisdom and just allowing our children to run wild a little more and helicopter parent a little less. Especially when we already know and we can conclude motor skills and hand-eye coordination improve childhood cognition. Let's just say we know overall that this is applicable to any age. And that's my point. Mind, body, life. Any age. 
You need to move. You need to read. You need to be active because of neuroplasticity studies. We now know that our brain is forever malleable. This leads me to end with, you know, the number one rated developmental educational system in the world is the Finnish model. Do you even know where Finland is? It's one, I've been there several times. It's one of the coldest countries with very little sunlight. They don't even make excuses to get outside. The Finnish model really is all about play. It's about physical activity, about practicing a musical instrument, being creative, playing in the real world. They don't even test. There are no tests because common sense tells us if you don't want to be a robot, you know what robots do? They're programmed with answers. You're programmed to regurgitate. Finnish model really respects each individual and develops each individual accordingly. A child actually interacts and observes hand and eye movements and all, all optimized brain development and healthy brain connectivity goes back to being creative, goes back to play. Humans have not evolved from linear to spin our childhoods interacting with a two-dimensional screen or existing in cyberspace. I mean, I believe this future shock is causing the minds and bodies of our 21st century children and people to short circuit. Every single day, research like, like some I just went over is being published about the importance of you know, strengthening and pruning those neural connections between the different brain areas is it, it's essential and it's part of a healthy cognitive development. So being sedentary and spending way too much time watching television causes both hemispheres of the cerebellum to shrink and to not connect properly with the left and right hemispheres of the cerebrum. Now this is proven. So why would you tolerate, why, how can you watch your child eating the wrong things, watching the television when you know you are damaging your legacy? And it takes a village to raise children. No more does a stranger hold any child accountable for anything. They, they just turn a, a blind eye because actually I think they're afraid of a litigatory lawsuit of that parent coming at them. How dare you say something to my child? That's what it's come to. And among other things, you know, this, this lack of connectivity between all four brain hemispheres can stunt a child's physical, emotional, social, and intellectual development. Now, luckily, this is something that we can easily change as parents, as teachers, as caregivers, um, as coaches, as consultants. The daily activities that include physical activity and improved motor skills are really going to bulk up the cerebellum. So keeping the cerebellum strong and well-connected to other brain regions is going to improve cognitive and social skills amongst many other things, again, especially amongst children. So daily activities that flex the cerebellum also reduce obesity, improve hand-eye coordination. And these cere cerebellar, I would say, of, you know, pertaining to the cerebellum activity strengthen the implicit learning of the automatic skills and they just complement the, the cerebralness. So the explicit learning of, you know, reading and writing and arithmetic, balancing the strength and connectivity of all four brain hemispheres, that's going to most likely benefit these children labeled with HD, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, and other, you know, all those labeled learning disabilities. I really want to thank you for tuning in. I know this, um, there was a lot thrown at you, but I hope you um, are a little more, <laughs> your, your lens has been widened and you enjoyed that. You can find me if you're curious. 
and you want to improve your health and wellness, maybe you're a professional athlete and you want to work on your mind, body, life skills or prepare for that transition into the real world, contact me on LinkedIn. Let's link up. Send me a message on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm easily reachable. Until next time, have a great day. That has been enough. Take care. Thank you for joining us. Listen every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern to Frederick Intiman host Mind Body Life. Connect with Frederick at www.globalvoiceradio.com. Tune in next week for another edition of Mind Body Life on Global Voice Radio.